Engineers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant say they're learning more about what caused one of their robotic cameras to get stuck. They sent it inside a reactor vessel earlier this month to get a better look at the damage there. And they say a newly released video is shedding light about what went wrong. This 60-centimeter snake-shaped robot was designed to navigate around obstacles amid strong radioactivity. But it stopped after crawling just 10 meters inside the containment vessel of the number one reactor. Video footage released by Tokyo Electric Power Company shows the robot tilting to the right. Officials say they've given up on recovering the device. Crew sent a second robot to retrieve the first machine, but the rescue robot also suffered a malfunction. Its camera stopped working due to radiation exposure. So they've decided to abandon both of them. Officials say the footage they retrieved before the initial device stopped working is helpful. It shows no major damage to part of the containment vessel close to the bottom. Melted nuclear fuel fell to the bottom of the vessel in the 2011 accident. The operator says it will analyze the footage and other data with the aim of eventually removing the fuel. public swimming pool damaged in the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami in northeastern Japan has reopened in Iwaki City, Fukushima Prefecture. The pool is about 100 meters from the coast. More than 100,000 people visited the pool every year before tsunami damage to the building's first floor forced officials to close it. The new pool makes me feel the city is recovering little by little. The complex includes a walking pool and a seven meter high water slide. Many families and children were on hand to take the plunge. Speaker of Japan's lower house is stepping down because of health reasons. The lower house is expected to approve the move on Tuesday. Liberal Democratic Party heavyweight Nobutaka Machimura submitted his letter of resignation on Monday. Machimura was hospitalized last week after falling ill. The 70-year-old has since been absent from lower house plenary sessions. He said he was diagnosed as having a brain infarction. I decided that my condition should not affect my duty as the house speaker, considering the heavy responsibility of the post. 
Machimura is a former Chief Cabinet Secretary and Foreign Minister. He became Lower House Speaker in December last year. The LDP plans to recommend former party Vice President Tadamori Oshima as Machimura's successor. Japanese government officials say they are willing to contribute another $40 billion to keep reconstruction work running in areas hit by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The amount would cover the five-year period from April 2016. For the first five fiscal years following the disaster, the government guaranteed to pay most of the recovery-related costs, but this so-called intensive reconstruction period will end in March next year. Officials at the Reconstruction Agency came up with their number after reviewing requests from three disaster-hit prefectures, Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima. Last year, people at the three local authorities said they would need more than $67 billion over five to ten years from fiscal 2016. The central government officials shaved the figure to $42 billion for five years, deciding the remainder should be covered by other sources. The agency officials plan to review the past reconstruction projects and compile a new framework for the next five-year period by the middle of this year. Toshiba has begun testing a hydrogen fuel cell system to use in emergencies. The invention supplies power to hundreds of people during natural disasters. The electronics maker unveiled the technology at a park near Tokyo. The company says its solar panels generate energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is stored in tanks and converted to electricity through a chemical reaction with oxygen. Toshiba says the system needs just water in the sun and generates enough electricity and hot water to sustain roughly 300 people for one week. I hope this will be one relief measure for a country that often faces natural disasters. Once tests are complete, Toshiba plans to start selling the technology later this year to local governments and commercial facilities. Had experienced its first outbreak of dengue fever in 70 years. Public health officials here in Tokyo are now taking steps to make sure the disease doesn't spread again. NHK World's Misako Oshie reports. Officials with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government are starting their fight against the dengue virus before mosquito season sets in. They are looking for larvae in stagnant pools of water and are dropping pesticide into gutters in nine parks. They are also trying to catch insects to see if they are carrying the virus. Last year, about 160 cases of dengue were confirmed around the country. Most of them were tracked to this park in central Tokyo. Yoyogi Park is one of Tokyo's most popular getaways. With the arrival of spring and warming temperatures, more and more people are expected to flock to the park. I did not know about that, and that is uh, alarming. The government to do something about that or something, that would be really nice. The discovery of the virus forced the closure of the park for nearly two months. The infections were initially limited to people who had visited the park, but soon the virus was found in others who had not been here. Dengue fever is spread by mosquitoes and not from person to person. Symptoms include severe joint aches, headaches, and fever. Officials say they will continue their measures against dengue twice a month Mosquito season begins in July, at the end of the rainy season. We would like everyone to take preventive measures and get rid of stagnant pools of water wherever possible. Until recently, outbreaks of dengue fever have been limited to tropical countries, but with global warming and the growth in international travel, the number of cases around the world is expected to continue growing. Misako Shie, NHK World. Japanese department stores are known for customer service. A Tokyo department store is taking things up a notch with the debut of Aiko, the greeting robot.
Aiko wears a kimono and works alongside a human employee at a ground floor information kiosk. It even bows to customers. Electronics firm Toshiba designed and built the lifelike machine. Aiko can move 43 parts of its upper body as it speaks. Its surface is covered with silicon that looks like human skin. A clerk told me it's a robot. That surprised me. Toshiba officials say they are working on similar robots for banks and tourist information centers. People in London will soon have the chance to enjoy a Japanese beef delicacy. The National Federation of Agricultural Cooperative Associations says it will open a restaurant in the British capital specializing in Wagyu as early as this autumn. Association officials say they have decided to buy a restaurant to promote genuine Wagyu produced in Japan. It plans to serve sukiyaki and other dishes. The aim is to allow customers to experience the taste and quality of Japanese beef and to give them some ideas about the various ways it can be prepared. The EU resumed Japanese beef imports last June. They were banned two years ago after outbreaks of foot and mouth disease and BSE. Producers are concerned that some Europeans are consuming beef they think is genuine Wagyu, but is in fact produced outside Japan. Japanese government officials are examining ways of boosting exports of agricultural products as a major pillar of the country's growth strategy. They are hoping to increase beef exports fivefold, from $42 million in 2012 to $210 million in 2020. I think this is an opportunity that may never come again. We want to work very hard to produce Wagyu that Europeans would like. The key to achieving that goal lies in attracting the 500 million consumers in EU countries. A Japanese-American woman has been making quilts about the 2011 disaster that hit northeastern Japan. She tours the U.S. with her creations, telling stories of her journey to other quilt makers. NHK World's Kenji McCulley has more. At a gathering, women in this community in Lawrence, Kansas, are making some quilts. Quilt making is a popular pastime in the United States and is often a communal activity. But what's not so traditional here is the imagery of these quilts. Here, Japan is surrounded by raging waves, and the sun seems to be shedding tears. And in this one, nuclear reactors are being hit by a tsunami, and radiation is spewed into the air. Was sixth and seventh grade. Cindy Perry, a Kansas resident, started making a series of quilts four years ago following the Tohoku disaster. Wow. Yeah, really hard to pull through oh. that fabric. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. Well, I wanted it to show, yes. you know. They were in me, they had to come out. Um, I felt like the series chose me to make them. I didn't really choose to make them, I don't think. I feel like they chose me. Perry was born in Japan, but immigrated to the U.S. as a one-year-old. But the country remains close to her heart. She still remembers the shock when she heard news of the disaster. Her husband, Mark, happened to be in Tokyo. He was safe and brought back newspapers with images of the devastation. These ended up giving inspiration for her quilts. At first, her quilts tended towards sad imagery. The agony expressed in this piece was what Perry was feeling at the time. I want to express the surreal, nightmarish scenario and convey the feeling of being dazed. Perry tells her fellow quilters what she wanted to express in the piece. Suddenly, the life that you worked so hard for, the life that you knew, it's gone. Last November, Perry visited the affected areas of Tohoku for the first time. What struck her most, she says, was a single pine tree that remained out of a forest of over 70,000 along the coastline before the tsunami. For Perry, it symbolized resilience and hope for the future. After her visit, Perry made a new piece titled Sakura, Cherry Blossoms. It is believed that the harsher and colder the winter, the more beautiful and fuller the sakura bloom in the spring. 
Perry hopes to pay tribute to those who continue to struggle in the wake of the disaster and to celebrate the hope for new life which spring brings. I hope that anyone that looks at it smiles and that they see a happier, brighter future for Tohoku and for Japan. Perry has made 12 pieces in this series and hopes to make a couple more to express that her thoughts are with those affected despite the time that has passed since the disaster. Kenji McCulley, NHK World, Lawrence, Kansas. Japanese space scientists plan to send a probe to the surface of the moon. They hope to launch it around 2018. If successful, Japan would be the fourth country to accomplish the feat. An official of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency announced the plan at a government panel meeting. We will use ultra-precise landing technology for the probe, which is named SLIM. SLIM stands for Smart Lander for Investigating the Moon. The probe is designed to use image recognition technology to identify geographical features so that it can land at the right place. JAXA officials plan to launch SLIM on an Epsilon rocket. They say the mission would help establish technology for resource exploration. The moon is the nearest celestial body to Earth. It's 380,000 kilometers away. The former Soviet Union landed its unmanned probe, Luna 9, on the moon in 1966. In 1969, Apollo 11 of the U.S. landed on the moon carrying three astronauts. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And decades later, China's Chang'e 3 landed and put a rover on the moon.